What's up, everyone? Branyan, good to see you, man. So, here we are. It's interesting. Um, the other night, last night, Desmond, what's up? Long time no see. Uh, foul fish, everybody. Good to see everyone. I'm getting a lot of dislikes on these videos over here. I think we got some uh, some uh, some haters coming over from that one video with the uh, capo dude. So the capo guy, I'm going to be going to Germany with. He's one of the other uh, people with the YouTube uh, channels, Sean. And um, so I'm going to get him to make the video with me, with the tuner. <laughs> Uh, that'll be awesome. No, not, not Jens Larson. Although Jens is a, uh, good dude. Um, uh, what is the wooden amp behind me? You know, everybody asked me that. What's up, Martin? What's up, Bray? Um, uh, that is a weird amp that I bought that sounds horrible. <laughs> But I bought it for, I don't know, like a hundred bucks. I thought that, um, uh, I'm sure Sean's a great dude. I didn't know Sean at all. And I'm going to be spending a week with him in Germany. So there we go. Um, uh, so I bought that amp and um, I played it in the store. And I thought, boy, this is a really cool amp. Maybe it'll be cool for something. I, and I don't remember the guitar that I played it, played through it. And uh and then I got home and I was like, mm, it's. I played it for my assistant GL, and he's like, mm, it's, it's not that good. <laughs> and then the guy I bought it from, he has a music store in here and and uh, around town, and um, I just didn't want to take it back, honestly. I was like, I I use it for something. I I it's almost like a cool piece of furniture. Um, so. I leave it back there because I think it looks, I think it looks cool. It's a pine box. You'd think it would sound good, but it's got a 15, but it's not even good for bass. I try to use it for some rehearsals and it doesn't, doesn't have any enough headroom. Uh, do I like solid state amps like a j jazz chorus? Yeah, I like some solid state amps for sure. Um, um, a flat spot for putting things. Uh, so yeah, so things are good. Uh, so the other night when I was doing my live stream on my other channel, I was talking about um, is rock becoming the new jazz, or is jazz is rock becoming the new jazz? And um, a guy wrote to me because I was talking about the um, the blocking of the uh, of the yes video, and a guy wrote to me that works with he's working on, uh, with John Anderson presently, and he said he was going to talk to him about this. And I said, um, he says, because John doesn't, you know, care about this stuff. What's up, Alan? You like that phase video? Cool, man. Uh, that was a fun one. Need to get you in here to record, Alan. Get you, get you on the guitar. Um, everybody, Alan, you should. Everybody should follow Alan's channel. Alan was the singer that um, was in the band Airspace that I worked with. That is one of my favorite bands I ever worked with. And Alan's one of the best musicians I've ever worked with, period. And he's one of the best guitar players that I know. And uh, you guys should follow his channel. Alan, feel free to put it in the in the um, put it in the comments here. Um, Yes, the Raven. He had a couple different incarnations of his, uh, of of what he does in his solo works, and it's all phenomenal. He's an incredibly good singer. He's an incredibly good lyricist, and he's an incredibly good guitar player. So, um, so there you go. Yeah. So the yes, video was blocked. Um, it's on flat five now. Um, so this guy said he was going to talk to John Anderson about it. And, and he said, John doesn't mind. He thinks it's cool that, to have fan videos. You're making a Baca album? Oh, I can't wait, Alan. 
That's going to be ridiculous. I cannot wait. Alan is an amazing classical guitarist, one of the best. Um, so I said to the guy, can you get me an interview with John Anderson? Because that would be even cooler. So he said he would talk to him. Um, I'm also going to be going up to Nashville. And um, yeah, everybody follow Alan's channel. Alan is unbelievable. Amazing. His, I mean, he's got some of the best covers I've ever heard. In addition to his own original music, which is unbelievably great. And we did a couple records together. And it's literally some of the best stuff, you know, it's my favorite stuff I've done. Um, so, uh, but this, this is kind of an interesting concept. So I was talking to... to um, to my buddy Dave Honorado that's been in some videos with me, Rhett, and Dave. And he says, um, we we're just talking about this, about John Anderson. And, uh, you know, I wonder, I wonder how many people, this is why, this is the, this is the, um, this is why this is kind of, uh, this is the only thing of, of, streaming with comments and not actual people being able to speak. Um, I wonder how much legacy that, that these bands legacy matters to them. I really do. Um, I wonder if the people, you know, John Anderson, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you guys, he's out playing still, he's making records, he's singing. But I wonder how much their legacy really matters to them. I can see bands like Zeppelin, their legacy mattering to them. I can definitely see that. But I wonder how many, I wonder if there's, um, I wonder, what's up, Chops? Oh, yes, and, and John McCain, I'm, I'm very, very sad about. Um, so, but um, I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to get into that right now. Um, yes, it's, it's. Tragic and um, what an incredible, incredible man. Um, so, you know, you, you'd like to think that people, or you, you would think, not like to think, you would think that people that are, um, that are, out there still making music that their legacy is really important to them. Um, but maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's, um, maybe it's not. Maybe John Anderson, you know, yes, had their heyday. Chris Squire's gone. Um, you know, the guys are 70 years old. Um, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's really uh um Jerry, very cool. Subscribe to Alan. He's so good. Um is Elton John a blocker? Probably. You know, I don't know. I wonder if I could interview Elton John. I bet I could. Um So so, anyways, that's 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 it. It's it's interesting to me. Um, somebody wrote in the comments here after the yes video was blocked that that um, that it pro it must have been done by somebody because it took so long to block it. Um, it did so long to it took so long to block it, and someone else wrote that uh, maybe um, maybe he's, they signed a new deal with a new publisher or, or something like that, and then they went through and, and scrubbed the internet of these things. But um, yeah. Could have been the number of views. 
uh, one of the things about search ranking, even if there's a view that is, um, if there's a video that has more views that your search ranking, I, I was talking to a YouTube person, you know, when you get 100,000 subscribers, I'm pointing back to the right there, that, uh, where is it? Right there. That's my 100,000 subscriber thing. Um, I had a film scoring thing that was top film scoring thing. Um, one of my videos, John Williams or something, if you type in film scoring on YouTube, the first thing, I've, I've got, I don't know, six, seven things on the first page, including the top thing. But the Hans Zimmer video that, that uh, for Masterclass has five million views, but that was down lower. Even though my video only had, I don't know, 50,000 views, 100,000 views, something like that, John Williams video, maybe, no, maybe it's 100, 200,000 views, I don't know how many. Um, and I asked the person that you have a, your, you get a, a YouTube rep and I asked her, well, why would my videos be ranking higher than Hans Zimmer that has 5 million views? And, and I don't know that she really knew the answer to that, but she said, well, she, she said that watch time, your watch time is longer than, than, than those videos and you get ranked higher for watch time. Um, and which makes sense. And also those were all paid for those views because they were running those on, um, they were running those as ads and those 5 million views were all paid, um, were all paid, paid for. So um, it, it probably doesn't rank it as high as high either. But um, so it's possible that because of, uh, the watch time on the yes video that it was outranking the the actual roundabout video even though it's got you know however millions of views on it it's it's possible it was ahead of it i mean i never look for that stuff um so uh so anyways that's that's one of the answers you know i was a little bit pissed the other night about it but you know, ultimately, the video was out long enough. It kind of did its thing. People saw it. People that are Yes fans saw it. Uh, it's up at flat five now. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't like to get my my videos blocked. I'm a completist, and I'd like to have that complete list on there. I don't like three videos out of the 40 being gone. Um, so... Um, Yeah, watch time triggering a block. Yeah, that that's J Bone. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that uh, that watch time possibly could have moved it above the uh, the, the actual video, and it could be watch time. You know, because because I mean, how many people are going and listening to Roundabout on YouTube right now these days? Uh, the people that are. I mean, maybe they are. I don't know how many views Roundabout has, the, the official video. Wait, do they even have an official video of it? I don't even know, to be honest with you. Um, oh, and the... Um, oh, so so Gary, is that true that the SEO algorithms are, are random of late? Okay. Okay. It's interesting. I heard that Casey Neistat put out a video on drones and got 750,000 views. And he was saying something about it on, uh, I follow him on Twitter. Okay, 35 million views. Um, unofficially. Um, yeah, so maybe there's something weird going on with that, but... Uh, look, if I could get a John Anderson interview, that would be amazing. Um, I was, uh, I've been in touch with some people about going to Nashville and doing some interviews with a couple different producers, like Dan Huff, uh, who's done a lot of huge country records, and he's a great guitar player. Uh, he's an excellent producer. Um... Ed, need a million views to be noticed? You don't need a million views to be noticed. Trust me. I All I needed was uh, was about 
300 views on here to have my video taken down when I played the Beatles the other night. It takes no views to be noticed. Um, what's up, Peter? Uh, did they sign their rights away? The official Yes channel has 700,000 for the for that song. Well, there you go. Um, you meant for a new band. No, a million is not a lot. For a band, you know, for bands, for songs, people listen to them over and over. You know, it's, uh, you know, you get into the billions on some songs. I mean, I don't think a song is a big hit on YouTube. You know, if I look at the YouTube numbers and it's under 100 million, I don't think it's that big of a hit. So, um, a video on an Alan Holdsworth solo. Um, you know, I was talking with my friend Daryl about that. Um, about doing a video on a Holdsworth solo. He, he, he and I were talking about that. And I don't know that... that um, uh, the, Holdsworth solos are really um, difficult to break down. They're not difficult to break down, but they're... they're um, they take a long time to explain what he's doing. There's such a... Um, uh, there's such a, it's, it's not like doing a, what makes this song great about, um, <laughs> about, uh, who's the the first band that I did, uh, Blink-182, you know, roundabout, I had 209,000 views before it was blocked. So what's up, Elliot? Elliot, I've been meaning to write you back. Sorry, man. I will, I will send you that stuff. I've been, uh, been going crazy. Um, I promise I will get it to you in the next two days. Um, David, uh, let's see. What is the first cluster in the Pink Panther theme? Um, you know, I, I'd have to think about that and then ask Dylan. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, what else is going on uh, to talk about? Um, I am um, I'm really amazed that the so I've hit 491,000 sub, uh, subscribers. So I have uh, I'm over 491. So I have 8,000 subscribers to get to 500,000. Um, that's pretty crazy. Best email to write me at is uh, rickbeato1 at gmail. Um, if you watch your video twice, will it register as two views? Yes. Watch my video on practicing. Turn it on on your other, uh, on another thing and just let it play. Um, you know, everybody asks me about warm-ups. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do a warm-up video today because I haven't played in a few days. And um, and I really needed to do a, a good warm-up today. And um, what's up, Peter? My hands feel good, but my, um, my index finger, a little bit of arthritis there. Uh, just sore from practicing. It does, it does, honestly, it does not bother me when I'm playing. But... Um, But yeah, eight thousand more subscribers and be at half a million. I I, uh, I st still can't fathom that. And then, and then we start over. And um, and we head towards a million. What's up, C three? Um. So I mentioned the other day that I talked to. Uh, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio, and I, I'm planning a trip. I want to plan a trip to England 
that's that's another uh, thing that, that's going to happen. I'm going to do a trip to New York, a trip to uh, to Germany. And that's going to be interesting, the German trip, with because uh, Adam Neely is going to be there. And... Um, I used to have perfect pitch, Julio. Yeah. Although, I mean, when I, you know, uh, to me that I think that's a flat, but it's it's uh, you know, it's probably a little bit. Um, Probably a little off. Five hundred thousand flat five. It is a flat. Was the tuning good, Tom? Um, it was a flat. Okay, see, Dylan. We were at dinner tonight, and Dylan says, uh, "Sing an A," and I sang it, and I was slightly flat on it. He's always like. Daddy, you're always out of tune. You're always flat on it. And um, uh, so I thought that time I actually pushed it higher than what I hear in my head. Um, but it's pretty much gone. My perfect pitch is pretty much gone. Um, it's been for years. Um Oh, so the perfect pitch video, Maxton. Maxton is actually spelled, everybody spells it M-A-X-T-O-N. It's M-A-C-S-T-O-N. Like Mac, M-A-C. Maxton. Um, so the perfect pitch video I think we're going to do on Tuesday because Carol and Michelle are going to be here along with Maxton and Dylan. Four perfect pitchers. Uh, why does it leave? Um, you know, I, I think because your brain changes. Um, I think your brain ch uh, uh, changes. Uh, the, the actual truth of it is that I... Um, I have a... Um, I probably have the the um, it's interesting perfect pitch is you'll notice like like when I played for Maxton when I play him a note I play a note and I, he's he says uh, B flat and he's always right. But it takes him, it's not that instantaneous. Um, it's not instantaneous, like if I play it for Dylan, for example. And uh, it's, I noticed that everyone that I've ever tested with Perfect Pitch has, um, um, has different speeds of Perfect Pitch. It's fascinating. But a friend of mine that I talked to, that I used to talk to, I haven't talked to in a long time, doctor friend of mine, went to Johns Hopkins. He says um, that he thinks that, that when you, that there are chemical trans, neurotransmitters in the brain that he suspects are related to perfect pitch, that if you don't, if they're not activated, and I know we have doctors on here, Peter, you're on here, and that uh, it's possible that that when they're not used for a few months, if you haven't thought about pitch, that that they can be inaccurate at first because the brain doesn't have those those um, uh, those chemicals ready to fire. He said he mentioned something about creating DNA or something, or uh, that you have to. I wish I could uh, uh, remember this conversation that we had, but um, something about when uh, 
Is it RNA? Okay. Ribonucleic acid. Um, that would need to be synthesized. Because I said, people ask me, oh, does Dylan ever make mistakes? I said, if he hasn't, if you haven't asked him a note, I've said this before on here, but I'll say it again. If you haven't asked him a note, to, to name a note in three months, and I'll play a bunch of notes, once in a while he'll get one note off, always by a fifth. And I'll be, what? And I'll, then I'll say, you know, it'll be, you know, I'll play B flat and I'll say E flat. And, um, um, okay, so the brain discards areas that not use and reassigns that area for something else like perfect pitch. Memory is rewritten and refreshed during a person's life. It's like losing your chops, but it comes back and, and it may be, um, it takes time to make new proteins. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so it's possible, Peter, that that if it's not been used, if his brain is not accessing that part of wherever the structure is, the you know plenum temp temporal that they think is uh, you know there there's a theory that they they've done MRIs of pe on people with perfect pitch, and they say the left plenum temporal is larger than a normal person's and the right is smaller than normal. Normally they are symmetrical, but they are asymmetrical. They say that the right has been pruned, they think, when people with perfect pitch. Um, so uh, so my, my, this friend of mine thinks it's possible that it needs to be refreshed. Um, and which is really fascinating. He also think thought that thinks that there might be structures because it's always off a of fifth that it has to do with the overtone series. That maybe those um, um, that maybe the the structures that recognize this are right next to each other in the in the in the brain. Um, but. This is not algorithm, so this is memory. This is memory. This is accessing a memory bank of of uh, of pitch, basically. And there must be. I mean, I'm just. I, I'm not a doctor here. Um, there has to be. Um, There's got to be, I, I'm reading your comment, Jari, which I always do. Every comment you write, I read. If tune is forced up, uh, let's see, forward, you pitches you hear detunes, stretches lower. Interesting. Um, uh, there's got to be some type of neurons associated with perfect pitch that people that are faster at it, that are able to pick out more notes, uh, maybe they're, uh, the, the connections to wherever lo long the amygdala or wherever, wherever it is that, uh, long-term memories are stored in the brain, um, that maybe some people have more connections there and, it, and they're able, I mean, why can Dylan pick out these, these dissonances, uh, uh, in the, in the middle of notes, whereas a lot of people, most people with perfect pitch, once you start getting above four notes, five notes, they, they can't hear all the notes. But Dylan is, uh, you know, can dissect these chords. Um, so, you know, why do some people have better chops than others? You know, because their neurons are, you know, their motor neurons can fire faster and more accurately. The algorithms associated with with particular movements are, are you know, those pathways are so refined. The 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 myelin sheath that that's coating insulating the neurons is thicker or something, right? And it transmits those signals to the to the um, motor neurons faster. So you're able people that that have uh, you know have incredible chops are able to you know, to get their, um, you know, to, to, to really get their fingers moving. 
Let's see, Jim, sometimes you can tell if a single string like A is out of tune if you've heard it so many times, but you don't think that counts. Um, I think that everyone has, or most people have a a sense of perfect pitch, at least have, have some um, have some level of perfect pitch. And Jack, yes, some people have better perfect pitch than others. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've seen it right here in this place with multiple people that have had perfect pitch. I've had here in my studio probably 20 people over the last 15 years that have had perfect pitch. Uh, motor skills are tied to specific types of muscle fiber, fast, fast twitch muscle fiber. Um, now I'm wondering if your, you know, if your hands, if the muscles in the hands uh, contain more fast twitch fibers, you know, that that you use them every day. Um, I don't know if you can increase your, you know, the the amount of fast twitch fibers. I mean, when I was in school and running track, we used to do things because I did the jumping events and we used to do. Um, box jumping, which is a plyometrics, which is really just started in the 70s. And the theory is that explosive motions, uh, explosive activity like that, where you jump down, you jump from the ground onto a box, back down, back up, and you stay on the ground as little as, as you know, for the least amount of time as possible. And it, it improves your explosive power. And there's no question that my vertical jump increased dramatically from doing that for a couple of years. I mean, I could, my vertical jump was over, over 40 inches and, um, and doing plyometrics was, was, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if that's increasing the fast twitch muscle fibers or, or what it's doing, but, um, let's, let's see here. We got, we got, um, Prior practice prevents piss, piss poor performance. Bob, that's too that's too uh, too many things here. Uh, can Burby Pitch make someone play too mechanically? Uh, no, I mean people play mechanically that play mechanically. Um, back then, they we jumped on boxes. People still jump on boxes. Nuclear, that's true. Um. Can people with perfect pitch improve their perfect pitch? Yes, and I'll tell you why, Peter. Um, Michelle, when she first came in here, uh, I tested her perfect pitch, and we were working on the ear training course. And I was testing her ears to see what types of interval combinations were difficult for her. and. As we went on, and after about six weeks, and she did a lot of transcriptions here, her pitch got so became so fast. Not only fast, but her ability to hear, you know, she could hear six note chords and just grab them. I'd play a chord, and she would do this, and then she would name the notes. Her, her pitch was, was one of the fastest I've seen. Um... And it was not when she first came here. Um, she is, uh, she is, Michelle has a phenomenal ear, absolutely phenomenal ear. Um, let's see here. Relative pitch is worse than your friends, but I can hear or notice some tamaral subtleties, engineering techniques better than your friends with better ears. Um, Sprinters and distance runners have have different muscle development. Tom, the question is that is that from sprinting? Because I was a sprinter. We didn't do any distant run, distance running when I was uh, in college or when I was in high school running track. Since I was a sprinter and jumper, they did not want us. Um, they they did not want us to do any distant run, distance running. All all explosive things sprint it was all sprinting 
interval training, box jumping, everything like that. Uh, let's see. She mimed the chord before playing that helped her. Yeah, she she um, would visualize it like that. She would do, 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 and she was so fast. She was. She is so fast. Uh, so, um, but I want the video. I'm going to do. I'm not going to do a thing where um, where we're going to be testing them. I want to talk to them about their experiences with perfect pitch. It'll be very very. Um, <laughs> all dark meat, no white meat. There you go, exactly. Uh, uh, um, uh, so I think that um, it'll be interesting to hear what they say um, about that, uh, about how their difference in when they... Do, I mean, Maxton, I know, did not realize that he had perfect pitch. And his dad is a professor at Berkeley. He did not realize he had perfect pitch until he was a um, teenager, maybe? I think that... Um, I think that he thought that everybody just knew that. And I think that, uh, that some people... Um, don't realize that everybody can't do that. They just they just figure everybody can. Um, so it's uh, what's up, Shiloh? Um, relative pitch is more useful, right, David? Yes, relative pitch is more useful. Um, because it stays. Um. It's better if you have perfect pitch and relative pitch, though. His dad obviously listened to complex music. Exactly. Nare. Piano pitch. <laughs> Nare, when, when, uh, when I first met Nare, we were talking about this. And um, first time I ever talked to her, and I, and I asked her if she had perfect pitch. She said, well, I have piano pitch. I said, well, piano pitch? What's that? Well, that's what they call it at Berkeley, and um, that I can recognize stuff on the piano. So I picked up my guitar, and I said, what note is this? And she says, F. I said, you have perfect pitch. <laughs> so, um, and she laughed at that piano pitch. Um, but, but having good, the, 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 the important thing for people with perfect pitch is to be able to recognize chord, sonor chord sonorities um, and recognize their color, not just hear the indiv individual notes, but, uh, but know what the sound you're hearing is, you know, if... Um, um, you know, if you're hearing a minor seven flat six chord, or if you're hearing a um, um, minor seven flat five with a natural nine, being able to recognize those things. That's really, uh, those are important. You should be able to recognize the sounds that you hear. Um, trombone and unfretted string players, relative pitch is awesome to have the small just to make chords sound better. Uh, that's absolutely true. I think that a lot of my hearing development from playing bass in orchestra uh, was incredibly, uh, especially for my arrange, arranging skills, writing skills, um, tuning. It doesn't matter how, your, how good your pitch is. You have to be able to tune with other people. And when you play bass in an orchestra, and all the chords are built off it. There's a um, there's a sound that you get that um, and, and it's interesting because I would when you're playing the bass when you're playing upright and you're playing in you know first position here your um, many times you you put your ear if the or if it's if it's a loud passage. And you're playing, uh, you know, diamonds or something. A lot of times, um, 
I would put my ear on the neck because you couldn't really hear your bass, you know, in the din of everything that was going on in the orchestra. So, so um, you became really hyper aware of tuning. So I would put my left ear up on the neck of the bass. I would, he and then I would use my other ear for for the pitch reference for the other bass players, and for the. Um, you know, for the tuning of whatever passage we were doing with the orchestra. And, and I would always be making minute adjustments on it to make the, you know, especially on held chords. You know, if we were doing something like, you know, something slow, the uh, Barber Adagio for strings or the Brahms Requiem or, you know, something that had a lot of notes, a lot of, a lot of uh, whole notes. Um, um, is, um, you know, that, that was, that was incredibly good practice, really good practice. I, th I think that, uh, that if I had to say what one of the most important things in my schooling was, it was ensemble playing, um, playing an orchestra. That was probably the most, because uh, um, that's the only ensemble I played in. You know, I never played in a big band in college. The only time I played in a big band, I conducted a big band and I taught arranging, but I never played in a big band until I took a semester off during grad school and I went to Aruba and played in a big band for four months with a guy, a lot of guys from Eastman. Um... I got a call to play guitar in this big band, and it was a um, place they put us up in a hotel, played at this casino every night. They had no air conditioning, and we had two different tuxes, a white and a black tux. Oh, my God. We'd have to have them cleaned every day because you would sweat so much with no with no AC, and we'd do it an hour-long set once a night. Everything was paid for. Um, and lived in Aruba for four months played some great arrangements it was it was um it was it was amazing it was a great experience i wouldn't say it's amazing it was a great experience the guys were great players in there um gad and levin are from rochester i don't know tony levin did he go to eastman i'm not sure um but um must be rough to live in aruba for free no no eric it wasn't free i got paid I lived in Aruba for free and I and got paid. And they wired the money, you know, I, I want to say they wired it back to the States or something. I can't remember. It was back in the in the mid 80s. But the, here's the best part. And this is the weirdest thing. So we get to Aruba, we start rehearsing, and um people say, Oh, you need to go to this place, the Adagio Cafe. And uh there, it's a jazz club. It's an after-hours jazz club. And and the owner, Pepe, is a jazz guitar player. He's he's going to want to meet you. And so I, we we ended up going there and, you know, with probably the second night we were there. And there was, there was it was an after-hours jazz club that opened up at 1 a.m. This is in Aruba. So, um, so every night for four months... Um, we went to the Adagio Cafe after we finished playing. Our set was at, at 10. We played from 10 to 11. Then we'd eat dinner. I'd usually go go for a swim, uh, then get changed, and then we'd head out at, at about 1.30 or so in the morning. We'd all go out to this club with, with our instruments. And um, we would play all night until eight in the morning until the till it was light out and then go back and go to go to bed every night and we would play tunes these are all eastman guys too except for me i was i was going to nec i was the only nec guy but um but pepe played guitar he's a great guitar player and he'd come up and sit in and he and i became really great friends and uh and all the people that worked at all the casinos would come there after 
to hear us jam. And we would play impressions for 20, we, everybody would do 10 minute solos, it was amazing. It was really, really fun. We would do all this uh, standards. We'd rehearse tunes. Since we were a big band and we had time, we'd work up arrangements with three horns, you know, and um, one of the guys, Joe Mag Magnarelli, um, Joe Magnarella, um, he's, he's, I want to say he's teaching at uh, Juilliard now. He's a jazz trumpet player. Um, uh, some of the guys I'm still in touch with that were on this, but uh, yeah, so for four months, every night, I played one hour, got paid 500 bucks a week, all three meals were comped, uh, I got five, 500 bucks a week? Yeah, 500 bucks a week. Not a lot of money, but everything was free. And then um, and then, I played at a, at a After Hours Jazz Club every single night, all night. There you go. How's that for a story? Never heard that one. I forgot about that. And that's four months of my life. I missed one of my brother's weddings because I was down there, believe it or not. My oldest brother, Mike, missed his wedding. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Look at it. He's, he's been married for, whatever, 35 years now. And, uh... I'm not in the pictures. <laughs> uh, not much. Um, I had great jobs back then. Um, why can't that ever happen here today? Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know. My dad didn't want me to do it. He was, uh, he was really against it. Uh, I have a great. I have some great pictures from from back then, though. I'll put them on my Instagram. You should all follow my Instagram. Whoever doesn't, um, wait. Somebody asked a question back here. Buffalo is bigger than Rochester. That's true. And the jazz scene in Rochester used to be way better than Buffalo's. Benito says, Rick, do you know your son's IQ? And do you? it increased by doing your ear training with him yes i don't know his iq um but i I'm sure it's very high um and yes i believe that um it's that it's um due to that i i mean what it's got smart smart parents i like to think there's some genetics in there but i think that ear training helps um how old was I? I was 22. 22? Yeah. 22. It was 1980... 1984? 1985? Wait. 1985. So it was 23. Um, and I remember I had to take... Um, this is coming back to me now. Now I remember why I was in Ithaca when with Smitty. Um, that's right. Okay. All right. All right. This all makes sense now. Because I took a semester off from grad school, I had to make up the semester, and I went to um, I went back to Ithaca College. I got NEC to agree to let me take summer classes in Ithaca, um, and transfer them over to make up my semester. I don't know why Ithaca though. And I moved to Ithaca for the summer. I got an apartment with Smitty. Uh, and then I went back to, um, to New England. And, um, and then in the fall, then I was caught up actually is what it was. Anyways, so that's, um, you're in Ithaca, Paul, you work at Cornell. So I taught at Ithaca, I went to Ithaca undergrad from 81 to 84, and then I lived there, so I was there in the summer of 85, maybe? Summer of 86, and then I taught at Ithaca, then I went back, 
I went back to Boston, finished my degree, and then I came back and I taught from um, at Ithaca College from 87 to 92. Um, everyone has a friend named Smitty, J-Bone. They do, right? Uh, the Tufts NEC curriculum. You know, Eric, it was going on back then. The Tufts, uh, so I had students that were uh, that were guitar majors. I was the grad assistant that I, um, that I, uh, so I taught, I taught a guitar ensemble. I taught like a, um, maybe we call it a guitar rep class. Did I go to, ever go to the Haunt? I played at the Haunt a million times. Not only did I go, the, did I play at the Haunt? There's a guy John Peterson that used to own it back in the day. But I saw Fish play there in 1988, uh, and I told Trey when I worked with Trey, he says, he said, "Did you ever see Fish play?" I said, "Yeah, I saw Fish play. Um, I only saw Fish play once. I said at the Haunt in 1988." Um, and he said, what? I remember the haunt. We used to play there all the time. I was like, John Peterson. He's like, yeah, of course. It was hilarious. Um, so yeah, the haunt, great place. The haunt and the nines were the two places that I used to play all the time. Other places too, but Simeon's. Um, trying to remember the other, other joints. Um, any future videos on recording horns and woodwinds? I'm sure, yes. Yeah. Come back and jam. <laughs> uh, I was not talking about Smitty Smith. I was talking about my friend Smitty. Paul Smith, Deb. Love playing there. Always pack great crowd. Oh, yeah. That was great. Those were great times. Um... Can we have a live Rick and interim music performance? You know, uh, Maxton and I were talking about that. We're going to do a, um, a medley video where we're going to play. Um, I'll play guitar. I got to find somebody to play bass, maybe Rhett. Um, and we're going to do a medley. We'll do a video that's medley. I'm not sure of what, but we talked about it on Friday. Um, so I've got a couple videos coming out. I did a video, uh, with Rhett and my friend, Dan Hannon. Dan was the, um, my buddy that was in the video, the four chords of pop that, what is it? Four chords of pop. It's one of my biggest videos that I have. Um, so I'm going to do that. That's, that's already done. We already shot that. I'm going to do What Makes This Song Great. I've got another one of those coming out. Um, not going to give up on it. Um, do I do parody, David? I've done some parody videos. I did the uh, the classical Rick and the jazz Rick video. My attempt at humor. Um Am I planning on doing any more videos that feature percussionist drummers? Absolutely, Jason, I'm going to be. Um, who's next for what makes this song great? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I know what I want to do. So I have a couple ideas. I have a couple ways around the blockers. And and uh, the block the blockers. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk about the song. I'm gonna take a song and do it live, where um, where I'm gonna get my friend Jason to come in and sing one of the songs that I want to talk about. Uh, that we're gonna do. What makes this song great? And um, and we're. I think it'll be a great, really great video. Um, does Rush block? No, Rush is not a blocker. Rush is cool. 
Tom, my real my real humor is in my responses on YouTube comments. That's where I have the most fun, anyways. Um, all your guitar buddies subscribe to my channel because of what makes the song great. We can't get enough. Do Carl Palmer, okay? Does changing the key confuse the blockers? You know, that's a good question, Peter. That, that's a very good question. I don't like doing that because it really affects the tonality when I'm playing. That People want to hear the sounds um, as they were recorded. So, um, but I get some interesting stuff. I may be able to do... Um, I may be doing a video with the guys, uh, guys from Incubus. I'm going to start doing things with the bands or with the producers of these songs. That's where that's what I'm graduating towards in the next um, in the next month. Next month. Um. So, anyways, okay, I'm good for tonight. I'm good for tonight. This is uh, this is great. I'm taking a look here. Go watch my video, my warm up video, if you can. Um, and you guys should share my vid my phase video on Reddit. Who's the Reddit person that can do that? Somebody share my my phase video on on Reddit. We are the music makers or whatever recording thing. Is there a recording thing there? Share it and uh, and give it an upvote. <laughs> Don't do a stream with the guys from Metallica. Everyone hate Lars. Do a slower upload and have people speed it up on YouTube to get past the blockers. Um... I don't know that, but that sounds weird. You guys are the best. 